Okay, so um, before we get back to lecture, let's talk a little bit about the final project. Everyone submitted an idea for the final project? Okay, so this coming week, what I want you to do is to think carefully about trying to break down your project into a number of uh, bite-sized chunks, small deliverables that will incrementally take you over the next five weeks or so to the final version of your, your final project. So just a little bit about the logistics, about how to submit things over the next few weeks. All of your weekly reports, you're actually going to be submitting exactly the same thing, which is on Blackboard, you're going to submit the URL that points to the wiki page for your project. So if you have a look at all the projects that are up there now, we have uh, this being a, a course on robotics. We have a number of bots that are there to, to help you. Um, and so if you have a look at your, your submission, you should see comments, and most of you should see a response from Wikiludobot down here. So Wikiludobot is scanning our subreddit and looking for the project tag in square brackets. If you don't have project in square brackets at the beginning of your submission, Wikiludobot will not have created a wiki page for you. If you find that you have that problem, just go ahead and resubmit. Just resubmit a new submission on the subreddit with that prefix specifically, and Wikiludobot should catch it. When Wikiludobot does catch it, it'll create a, a wiki page for you. And I'll just show you what the wiki page looks like. It'll start with an empty stub like this. And what you're going to be doing between now and next Monday is filling in a little bit of the details here. Um, what uh, Wikiludobot should have done for you already is to copy and paste your couple of sentence project description in here. So again, students next year who are thinking about uh, implementing your project will read through and see if this is something they want to tackle. If it is, they then will move on to project details and you'll have a very long itemized list here with all of the, uh, with all of the uh, all of the parts that make up your, your project. So you'll be filling this in as you go, but what I want you to do is to just copy and paste this URL that goes into Blackboard as your submission, and the teaching assistant or myself will be having a look at your wiki page and assessing your progress as we go until the end of the semester. Okay. You'll notice at the top here, there are, there's a prerequisites tag and a next steps tag. So uh, what you're going to be doing here is just replacing this with none, so there's no next step for your project yet. Um, and the prerequisite for most of you is going to be assignment 10. So you're going to be deleting this uh, boilerplate here and replacing it with a link that points backwards to assignment 10. And you're also going to be going to the wiki page for assignment 10 and adding and adding your project there. So you'll be adding yours to the list of all projects here. When you edit the wiki page, be very, very careful, please, because, of course, everyone is going to be editing this wiki page. Luckily, Reddit hosts a pretty good history and versioning system, but the best way to avoid any problems is just be, be very, very careful. Go in, make your change, and save it relatively quickly, and then we won't have timing issues and, and so on. So you're basically adding yours on to assignment 10 because at least going through most of your project ideas, all of you are starting from assignment 10. I think a few of you might want to actually start from assignment 4 because remember that students at the end of assignment 4 will have a blank simulator. So you can think about whether you want to actually have students build up from the blank simulator or starting with the quadruped. I think for most of you, it's probably starting from the quadruped. So you'll link from the end of assignment 10. If you were using both, like I was thinking of having mine compete with the quadruped. Perfect, right? Then you obviously would be starting, your, the student who's implementing your project would be starting from the quadruped. The first instruction you might have in your final project is make a copy of the entire source code and then start editing it so the student knows they always want to have the quadruped and whatever it is you're having them them build. Yeah. Make sense? Okay. Any other questions? The uh, the final project document has instructions for how to edit the what what edits you're going to be making to the wiki for for your first weekly report. Okay. 
Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about in terms of the final project here um, is I wanted to give you a couple of hints, certain things that will be useful as you go forward. I mentioned two things last time. One of them is that there is already a project that exists in the subreddit for turning the graphics off, right? Some of you have obviously realized it's kind of distracting and it takes a while to have this graphics window open up and render every one of your robots. You can actually turn off the graphics, which has two benefits. First of all, you'll evolve your robot much faster, and it will also run in the background. So you can start up evolving your robot with the graphics turned off and do whatever else you're doing on your laptop, and then play back with the graphics turned on one of your evolved robots. It's the first thing you can do. So that's called a blind simulation. You can also parallelize uh, your your project. So your Python code is starting up one instance of your bullet executable. There's no reason why bullet cannot start up four or eight instantiations of your executable and have all those eight run in parallel. While they're running in parallel, your Python code is waiting until it gets back eight numbers, which are the eight fitnesses from your eight robots that are being simulated in parallel. Those are two hacks you can already do. I wanted to talk about some others today, and I'll just sort of list them here. This isn't in the final project document, so you might want to take notes just for this, this part of things. Um, the first thing is to think about position versus velocity control. So for, uh, for the quadruped, you've been using position control. Right? You take the eight values that are arriving at the eight output neurons, and you're treating those eight numbers as desired positions, or in our case, desired angles. You take that desired angle, you take the difference between that desired angle and the current angle of the joint, and the amount of difference between those two things becomes the amount of velocity that bullet is going to apply to the joint. Right? That's called position control which makes sense for legged and armed machines because you're usually oscillating back and forth between different positions or different angles. For those of you that are tackling legged robots, you're somehow adding wheels to your robot. Uh, wheels usually requires velocity control. Right? If you think about it, if you have a wheel, you're not sending a value to that wheel. You don't want that wheel to reach a desired angle. You usually want that wheel to reach a desired velocity. So again, it really doesn't matter from the evolutionary algorithm point of view, right? Whatever your output neurons are, you can either treat those numbers as a desired position, if that, if that output neuron is controlling an arm or a leg, or you can treat the number arriving at that output neuron as a velocity, if that number is going to control a wheel. If you turn your quadruped into a legged, a wegged, quadruped, you have, eight, uh, you have eight hinge joints, and you might have four wheels on the four feet. So now you're going to have 12 motor neurons. Eight of them are outputting desired positions for the eight joints of the quadruped, and the last four output neurons are outputting desired velocities for the wheels. Right? The higher the positive velocity, the faster the wheel is going to turn forward. If the motor neuron outputs a zero, that means the wheel should lock in place. If it outputs a negative number, that means spin backwards. Make sense? Position versus velocity control. OK, that's one thing that, that might be useful. Another thing that's going to be useful to a lot of you are what's called in, uh, in robotics magic sensors. So a magic sensor is something that is relatively easy to simulate, but probably has no real uh, analog as a physical sensor. But it's a good way to scaffold your robot to help it uh, get started. So let's imagine, uh, I see a lot of you here want to tackle um, cl uh, climbing robots. So let's imagine for a moment we have a set of stairs over here, and we have our robot over here. How does the robot know where the stairs are? How does it know where the top of the step is that it needs to reach? There's different ways we could do that. You could do that by adding a virtual camera inside a bullet. 
So you can actually set things up where you have your one virtual camera, which is rendering the scene that you see when, you, when your graphics window opens. You can also put a second virtual camera inside, which is capturing a bunch of things from the robot's point of view. You can actually gl glue a virtual camera onto your virtual robot so it could see the stairs. What's the problem with, with that? Not impossible, but it's going to be pretty challenging. So the angle of the camera, right? So as the robot moves, the camera is going to move, unless you put the camera on a, on a stock that the robot can move and it can try and keep the, the camera stable. What other challenge are you going to have to tackle if you add a camera to your, your robot? Updating face in the right direction. Absolutely, right? Is the camera actually facing in the, in the right direction? We could make an omnidirectional camera. If you remember all the way back to the gantry robot from England. Um, to that one camera, the ground could be indistinguishable from a step. Could be, right? So there, how does the robot categorize or distinguish between ground and step, right? We've already talked about that. That's already <laughs> difficult. If you have a virtual camera sitting on board your robot, and let's say that camera has a relatively low resolution, 200 by 200, what, what are you going to do with those 40,000 numbers? Right? You don't want to have a neural network that has 40,000 input neurons. It's probably going to take a while to, to evolve such a neural network. Right? So you probably don't want to start with the camera. I mentioned the gantry robot, though, if you go back and have a look at that project. There were ways that they downsampled or they gave the robot a relatively easy way to collapse all those pixel values down to just a few numbers. But again, that's a pretty complicated approach. So we could do something simpler than the camera, which is you can make use of the, the ray class in Bullet. So you could add a whole bunch of rays emanating from the robot. So it, it at least could tell the, the distance of any one of these rays from the base of this ray to, to the tip, right? Could do that. It's a little bit tricky. So we could do something even simpler, which is to use magic sensors to start with, just to make sure that you could even evolve a robot that does climb stairs. And a typical set of magic sensors to use are uh, Euler angles. and distance to some pre-specified target. So let's imagine that uh, we want to allow the robot to figure out what is the relative position of the tip of its anterior foot, the foot that is closest to the stairs, and the top of the first rung of the step. So let's call this T. This is the target position that we would like the base of the foot to get to. So we'll use F or foot. Euler angles are, a set, are two angles which can dictate what is the relative angle between uh, a particular position in three-dimensional space and some target position. Right? So if I want to point at the beamer, I need to specify what is the, what is the horizontal angle between my arm and the be beamer and the vertical angle. So in a similar case, if, we, if you have the position of the foot, and the position of a target position you want to reach, how much does the tip of the foot have to rotate left and right, and how much does it have to rotate up or down so that the tip of the foot is at least pointing at the target position. Okay. So let's, uh, let's try and figure out what these Euler angles should be. Let's imagine that we were just to measure the x position of the foot and the y position of the foot, and the x position of the target and the y position of the target. You should recognize this from high school. Uh, from high school. So we're interested in this angle in here. Right? So we can use the x and y coordinates of these positions to figure out what this angle is. Let's call this angle 1, so one of the two Euler angles we're interested in. How do we find the second Euler angle? 
So one of these is going to give us the horizontal difference in angle between the foot and the target position. Could be 90 minus the first angle, or we could use, or we could use the x and z coordinates here, and that'll also give us the same the same thing. Uh, x of the foot and z of the, the foot. Either of these will give us two angles that will tell us the relative angle between the tip of the foot and the target position. There are other ways that you can derive this. Again, going back to high school, if you remember trying to go between uh, Cartesian coordinates and polar coordinates, you can do things like this in two dimensions. And if you invert these equations, you can get the angle on one side and x and y on on the other. This is the 2D version. If you go and look up the 3D version, you can also figure out what the two Euler angles should be. Okay, the third piece of information we want then is the distance between the foot and the target position. If you have those three numbers, the two Euler angles and the distance between the some part of the robot and the target position, that's usually enough for the robot to figure out how it should move to minimize D. So imagine now we have our neural network, and at the moment you've been feeding in as input touch sensors. So you could add in, you could keep the touch information and add three additional input neurons to your neural network. And at every time step, you would feed into these three input neurons the two Euler angles and the current distance. That should be enough for this robot, for example, to figure out how to reach the tip of its foot, how to, how to move its body so that the tip of the foot comes into contact with the top, uh, the top center of the first rung of stairs or whatever it is you want your robot to, to do. Some of you have projects where you want the robot to target and point at something. Obviously, if you want it to point at something, it's a good idea to have Euler angles as, as well. Okay, that's, that's probably going to be a useful trick for a lot of you. The other thing you might want to add in is not just the Euler angles and the distance, but also at the input layer, you might want to add in the deltas of these two things. So at time step t, you compute the current Euler, one of the current Euler angles, and you already have the Euler angle that you computed at the previous time step. Take the difference between those, and it gives you the delta. So it might be useful for your robot to know, is delta d increasing, meaning is my foot moving away from the target position, or is delta d decreasing, am I moving towards the, am, I, am I decreasing D over time? So it might not just be new, useful to know how, what are, what's the current state of my foot relative to where I want it to point or where I want it to step, but how is that changing over time? So if in the course of your final project, if you're having a hard time evolving your robot to do something, give it more information about uh, the relationship between itself and its environment. Make sense? Uh, another thing that might be useful uh, for some of you is force assist. This is particularly useful if your robot is dynamically unstable. Remember our discussion about legged locomotion. I see there's a couple bipeds in here. It's going to be particularly useful uh, for your bipeds. This is an old trick in robotics. If you're simulating your robot, imagine you have your biped, and as it starts to move, it falls over. Remember that in bullet, at any point in time, you can always query the orientation of a, of a body part, of an object. You could detect how much the robot is falling over and compute a compensating external force that you apply proportional to, uh, uh, perpendicular to the orientation of the robot and, in essence, push the robot back upright again. We talked about scaffolding, and you can think of scaffolding as like training wheels on a bicycle. This is almost literally training wheels on a, on a robot, right? As it starts to fall over, something pushes it back into, into place. 
so if you go and have a look at Bullet, there are ways to apply, calculate and apply external forces to the robot. You want to apply a force that's, uh, that's angled perpendicular to the orientation of the body part. And the more it's falling over, the larger the force you apply. As you're evolving your biped over evolutionary time, you might make the force assist less and less and less and less until in the last few generations of evolution, force assist is not applied at all. Continuing the metaphor of the training wheels on a bicycle, as the, as the biped gets better, you're gradually removing the training wheels from, from the robot. Tyler? Should the X and Y be uh, that could be the case. You, you guys figure it out, but you get the basic idea, right, for the Euler angles. Any other questions so far? Okay, force assist, again, very useful if you have an unstable, an unstable robot. Uh, another useful trick is early stopping. Again, this one is pretty intuitive and also very useful uh, for the biped. For a lot of your robots, uh, you may not need to simulate any given robot for the full thousand time steps. The robot may fail within the first ten time steps. Why continue evolving? Why continue evaluating it for 990 time steps? Right, you're wasting a lot of time. So you can put in to your bullet code a conditional statement that says, if the robot ever experiences this state. Just stop the simulation, write out a value of zero, the robot failed, and send that back to, to Python. Again, if you think about the biped, you might at every time step record the height of the hip of your biped. And if the height of the hip, if the Y component ever drops below half the height of the robot, so if it ever falls beyond this point, stop the simulation and either send back a fitness of zero, if you're very strict, if the robot falls over, you get no fitness, or you might just send back how far did the robot manage to travel before it fell over. Right? If you're using a biped and you put in early stopping, things will evolve very, very quickly. Right? You can adapt this for other projects. So for example, um, if we tried to adapt this for the stair climbing robot, if the foot hits uh, the, lower, the lower part of the step, you might also stop things. You want to try and select for robots that step up and onto the first rung of the, the stairs. There's other ways you can use early stopping. This will go a long way to speeding up your, your simulation. Okay, uh, again, we've already mentioned this, but uh, we've already mentioned scaffolding, but let's think about fitness scaffolding for a moment. So fitness scaffolding is the idea that you're going to change the fitness function over evolutionary time. So if you remember, uh, if you remember back when we talked about evolving passive dynamic walkers, they had a fitness function that looked like the following. Fitness is equal to d, which is the distance that the robot travels, multiplied by 1 over 1 plus x, where x is something that you want the robot to minimize. In the case of the passive dynamic walker, X was some sort of exaggerated movement while it was, while it was walking. Right? Uh, so we might, you might actually add in these terms as evolution continues. So you might evolve the biped to walk in a particular way, and once you get it to walk a certain distance without falling over, then you say, I want you to walk but I want you to walk in a particular way, right? You can sort of refine how the robot moves over evolutionary time by adding these terms to the, the fitness function. Now, what those terms should be, that's, that's up to you. Uh, let's see. Okay, the last one here um, that is, can be very useful, this is a bit of a mouthful, is multi-objectivization. Multi-objective multi-objectivization, and as the name implies, in multi-objectivization, you might use a multi-objective approach, which we're going to actually talk about in lecture 19 today. So now, your fitness is not just one objective here, but you might have multiple objectives. And instead of multiplying those objectives together, evolution is going to try and maximize these two terms independently. 
The reason why you might want to do that is because if you multiply these two things together, evolution also often tries to just strike a compromise. So it might say, all right, I'm going to maximize the distance of the biped, and I'm not going to care too much about x. Even if this second term is relatively low, I don't care. So we're going to talk about multi-objectivization in a moment, which is a way that helps evolution not strike a compromise where it's only trying to maximize one or a few of the objectives that you want it to, to reach. OK, so that's sort of a grab bag of different hacks and tricks that you can use to improve things. Again, the main idea here throughout the whole final project is scaffolding. See if you can get your robot to climb stairs or grasp a rung of a ladder with magic sensors. If you can, then you might want to replace the magic sensors with distance. Uh, and if you get that far, maybe, you, maybe a, a camera, right? But again, we want to try and do this in very simple steps as we go. OK. So back to uh, the lecture material. We're working our way through this section on challenges. We've been focusing on the reality gap. We started with the radical envelope of noise hypothesis, add noise to the simulator so that evolution doesn't lock on to inaccuracies or abstractions in the simulator. We looked at the Golem project, which connected uh, an evolutionary robotic simulator to a 3D printer. If you want to cross the reality gap, just keep printing out as many robots as you can until you finally print out one that does manage to cross the gap. We ended last time by uh, looking at the Resilient Machines project, which is once you have a physical robot, it's got two, actually three, evolutionary algorithms running, but we'll focus on just two for a moment. One of the evolutionary algorithms was evolving the simulator itself, and the second evolutionary algorithm was evolving controllers in the evolved simulator. Right? Okay. In lecture 19 today, we're going to look at the most recent uh, attack on the reality gap, which is the transferability project. And the basic idea in transferability project is we're going to use multi-objectivization, and we're going to evolve controllers against two objectives. One, which is the normal one, evolve a controller that gets a legged robot to move as far as possible. The second objective is to maximize the transferability of the controller. So we want a controller that not only gets the simulated robot to travel far, but also is a controller that works well on both the simulated and real robot. Basic idea. OK, looking ahead, um, when we finish uh, lecture 19, uh, on Thursday, we're going to have a guest lecture. Uh, this is a guest lecturer, Mark Wege. He's currently a PhD student in my lab. Uh, he's going to talk a little bit about the DotBot project. And the following Tuesday, Joey will be here, and she will be presenting her work on Twitch Plays Robotics. Both of these projects are attempts to crowdsource robotics. Why would we want to crowdsource robotics? The basic idea is we want to try and scale this up. Right? So a typical evolutionary robotics experiment that we've talked about so far, there's been one professor and a couple of grad students. Um, this semester, we have 40 of you doing different robotics projects. Could we get hundreds or thousands of people to be evolving robots on their computers and transferring robots and fitness functions and ideas uh, back and forth, right? So can we bring together very large numbers of robots, computers, and people to try and evolve robots be that are more complex than we've been able to do so far. So Mark and Joey are both going to describe their projects to you about different uh, approaches to this issue of trying to scale up robotics in, in this way. OK, so let's, uh, let's go to lecture 19 for a moment and have a look at the transferability project. Uh, this is a relatively recent attempt in the literature. So the reading for today is uh, the original research paper on transferability from 2010. And the way I've set up the lecture today, the way they sort of did it in the paper is sort of question and answer. So let's think about uh, a question here. Could we actually evolve controllers to produce locomotion and to be transferable? But if that's true, first of all, we have to think about how would you actually define the transferability of a controller? So let's start with, with that question. 
Well, I, I'm sorry. Let's set, set that question aside for a moment. Let's think about how we're going to do this. The, as I just mentioned, the, the main way we're going to tackle this problem is we're going to try and evolve controllers that are rewarded for the desired behavior, legged locomotion, and are punished for low transferability. Or if you want to turn it around, we're going to turn it around today and think more about trying to maximize transferability. So again, this gives us a little bit of a hint for how we're going to define transferability. Transferability is trying to minimize the difference between the simulated behavior produced by the controller and the real behavior produced by the same controller. Slayton, did you have a question? Oh, no. Oh, okay. Okay. Make sense? Okay. Now, we could do what we've done before, is to define these two objectives and then multiply them together. But in this project, they did not multiply them together. They used, instead, multi-objective optimization. So this is a particular kind of optimization process. We can do this in an evolutionary way if we like, which is what they did. So let's take our two objectives. So our two objectives is the desired behavior and the amount of transferability. Let's imagine each controller as a, as a point in the two-dimensional plane. So if we take each one of these controllers, imagine that we can measure the desired behavior. That one's easy. We take the controller, drop it into the simulated robot, and let's see how far the robot moves. However far the robot moves, that dictates the vertical coordinate of this point. The horizontal coordinate of this point is how transferable it is. Let's create a population of random controllers and then measure the amount of desired behavior produced by each of those controllers and how transferable each one of those controllers is. Again, we're setting aside for a moment how to actually define the transferability, but let's imagine we could. This is the end of generation one, right? We've measured behavior and transferability for each one of these controllers. What do we do in the next generation? Which of these controllers should survive and which ones of these should die off? Um, the ones closest to a uh, diagonal line with the slope of one. So we have a diagonal line with a slope of one. We want points that are as close to that as possible. Yeah. Does that make does that work? So I could uh, define I could a pony could get a lot of reward for being close to the line down here. So the top, the very top, and the far right. The very top and the far right, right? So yeah. if it was to be as close to the, this line oh, yeah, as possible, yeah. right? We yeah. want it to be, you want it to be up and to the right. My language wasn't okay. That's what I wasn't yeah, specific what I was enough. Thinking. Right. Exactly. So intuitively, this point, which is higher and further to the right of this point, is somehow better, right? So we're probably going to want to kill off these guys and produce randomly modified copies of these guys. Can we be a little bit more formal about that? Well, we can if we adopt this idea of um, what's called, I don't think it's on the slide here. This is an idea known as Pareto optimality. This is an idea that actually comes from economics, if you're interested in the background of this, this idea. So in Pareto optimality, we are going to, we're going to try and find the points that are Pareto optimal in the sense that there are no other points that are better than that point. And points that aren't Pareto optimal are not. They're called dominated solutions. So we're now going to go through each of our controllers here and label them with a binary value, whether they're dominated or not. And how do we do that? Well, a solution or a controller for our purposes is dominated if there exists in the population any other controller that beats it on all the objectives that we're considering. Okay? So if we look, for example, at this point here, there is another controller in the population, this one, it's actually a bunch of them, but let's just pick this one for a moment. That is both more transferable, this point is further to the right than this point, and this point also produces a faster robot than this point. This point has a higher vertical component than this point. 
Okay. This point is also dominated by a bunch of other solutions. What about this one here? I think this is actually a typo on my part. Right? If you look at this point here, I've labeled it as dominated. There is no other point in the population that is both more transferable and produces a faster robot. There's no point that is higher and to the right of this point. This point is to the right, but lower. This point is higher, but to the, the left, right? So if you're drawing this figure here, connect this point to this point and connect this point to this point. Okay. So once we've, once we've done that, we now have a whole bunch of points that are non-dominated and dominated. What do you think happens to the dominated points? Right? They're deleted from the population, and we make randomly modified copies of the non-dominated solutions. Okay. Let's imagine that we have now deleted these points. We take this point, we select this point at random, we produce a copy of it, and we introduce a mutation, and that new child controller has this transferability and this value of behavior compared to its parent controller. What do you think happens now? The copy becomes, it gets added to the non-dominated set, and the parent gets moved to the dominated. Exactly, right? So this, the parent at this point is non-dominated, but once we produce the children, in this case I'm just showing you one, and we recompute all of the solutions, whether they're dominated or not, this one goes from being non-dominated to dominated and gets dropped out of the population. If I, Again, I'm drawing a line to connect all of the non-dominated solutions together. You can see what happens. Absolutely, right? So now, now this figure is correct, right? So now, if we go back and look at this one, this one truly is dominated because this point is higher and to the right of, of this point. Okay, so I'm showing you just sort of a little animation here of what happens from generation one to two. I've just shown you one child. What happens if this parent produced a child that ended up at this point? Nothing, right? That child is dominated, this one remains non-dominated, that child dies off, you know, and away we go. Now I want you to mentally simulate evolution running forward into time. What happens after 10 or 100 or 1,000 generations? This line, uh, by the way, is known as the Pareto front. Pareto front. Why is it called the Pareto front? You think the front of an army, right, marching sort of forward in time. How is the front, Pareto front, going to change over evolutionary time? It's going to creep into the top right corner. It's going to creep into the top right corner, which is what we want it to do, right? The front is going to push up and to the right. What about the spread of these points here? Are they going to crush up into the, the top right? What's going to happen? What is the shape of this front going to look like over time? It's kind of hard to trace out, but um, developing for behavior and transferability alone are much easier than getting into the middle. Yes. So it's going to be kind of like a concave. Exactly. Loop. So if we did this for long enough, we would have a front that probably looks like this, right? Yeah. There are always going to be two points, one at the very top left and one at the very bottom right for the reason you just said, right? right? It's going to be relatively easy for evolution to find a controller that maximizes distance of the simulated robot, but fails miserably to transfer to reality. So it's going to have a very high behavioral value, but very low transferability. At the other extreme, it's going to be trivial for evolution to find a controller that has low behavior and very, very high transferability. What behavior do you think this controller produces? Doesn't move, right? That's a pretty easy one to transfer to reality. If you don't have a biped, right? Not, not always, but there's usually a pretty easy for evolution to find such a trivial solution. Those solutions, once they're in the population, it's, it's impossible to dominate them, 
right? They're sort of extreme solutions. What we're interested in, though, is, of course, these in the, in the middle. Okay, let's actually look at a real Pareto front from the paper. And again, I'm, I'm not satisfied with the way they did this because they're maximizing uh, behavior here and trying to minimize simulation to reality disparity, which is, uh, which is um, maximum transferability. So when you think about multi-objective optimization, it's usually easier to mentally think about all the objectives being maximized, push up and to the front, uh, push up and to the right, or all of the objectives being minimized and you're pushing down and to the left, right? It's hard to wrap your mind around a Pareto front that's pushing, uh, that's pushing up and to the left, but that's what they're doing here, right? And you can see it, obviously, because you can see the front here. All right, so uh, at this point, they had a, uh, actually, sorry, let's go back to the previous generation. They had a bunch of controllers here, and they had measured uh, how much each of these controllers got the simulated robot to move and this STR disparity, simulation to reality disparity. They took all of these controllers from the simulated robot and ran them on their physical robot, which I'll show you in a moment. At the next generation, that corresponds to all the circles. They did exactly the same thing. And you can see the Pareto frontier and the dominated solutions as well. I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. The horizontal axis here is the approximated STR disparity. So what I'm going to show you in a moment is they have a way to actually predict how transferable a controller is before they transfer it from simulation to reality. That's what approximated STR disparity is. Seems like a tricky thing to do, but we'll see how they did that in a moment. So all of the points that you see here also exist here, but here now they recorded the exact simulation to reality disparity. They actually took all of the controllers and ran them on the physical robot to see what was the amount of difference between how the robot traveled in simulation and how it traveled in, uh, in reality. So this point up here, which got an exact STR disparity of 14, that means that the simulated robot and the physical robot, when controlled by that controller, had a difference of 14 units of distance. This was done by French researchers, so I'm going to guess it's centimeters or millimeters or something like, like that. Right? So this controller produced a difference of 14 centimeters. These down here um, produced very little difference in distance of the simulated robot and the real robot. They left the points labeled as either non-dominated or dominated from before. You can see they've moved around a little bit. So far, so good? Okay. Okay, so let's go back to some of these, these questions then. Um, we're going to use multi-objective optimization here, um, but of, key, of course, if we want to try and measure the transferability of every point, the only real way to do that is to try every single controller on the physical robot. Why are we bothering doing anything in simulation at all? Right? So there's a, there's a problem here. We don't want to have to do that. So we're going to try and come up with a way of predicting before we transfer something to reality how well it's going to transfer. How do we do that? Okay, um, these visualizations are not in the paper. I tried to make these to build up an intuition for what's going on. Let's go back to generation zero. And let's imagine we have a bunch of random controllers in our population. We can measure the vertical component of each of these points. We can drop each of these controllers into the simulated robot and see how far the simulated robot travels. But we're going to collapse our, our transferability objective down so that all the points lie along the same vertical because we don't know what their transferability is. Right? So this is kind of a weird Pareto front. We've got a whole bunch of points vertically here. Let's imagine now that we want to take one of these points, just one of these controllers, and try it out on the physical robot. Which one would you take? Which one would you pick? Okay. 
You only get to try out one of these controllers on the physical robot. Which one are you going to pick? And why? Um, so I would go for uh, closest to the middle. Now okay. I thought about going for the top because why not? You know, just do the one that got the best score in the new simulation. But generally speaking, because the reality um, gap does exist and we can yeah. relatively look at simulation, I don't know. It seems like hedge our bets and pick yeah, something it, it in the middle. Be better to be clearly safe than sorry. We could. But let's be optimistic. Maybe we will cross the reality gap in one go, right? Depends on the robot, depends on what we want the robot to do. We could, we could be a little bit conservative and pick something in the middle. Let's not. Let's actually pick the one at the let's actually pick the one at the top. The one that travels as in far as simulation as possible. Why not? We may be done in one one step, right? Okay. Here's the simulated robot. Here's the physical robot. Uh, you'll notice they actually used a Wegged robot for this project. Um, in this project, they locked the wheels. So it's a Wegged robot, but they reduced it to just its legged form. I don't know if I'll be able to play this directly in here. There it is. Okay. That's the point at the top. Tell me about the fitness function here. Was it maximizing forward locomotion? The robot doesn't walk forward. Right? It's just displacement. However far the robot got from the origin was fine. In this case, the robot decides to actually crawl to the side. OK, that's, that's the best controller they had in the population. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't in Generation Zero, as you can probably imagine. Right? This is some time along, but imagine that, that this was. Take this controller and drop it onto the physical robot, and they got this. Looks promising for a moment, huh? Yeah, exactly. Right. There's the reality gap, right? If ever there was a great visualization of the reality gap, that's it. What happened here? Why did this robot fail to cross the reality gap? The investigators don't know. We don't know. People have been looking at this for six years. If you think you have an answer, email the authors. They would love to know. Very hard to tell. This is why the reality gap exists, right? OK, so we have one controller. We know its behavior component. And we also know its transferability controller uh, component, right? Terrible. So where is that point going to end up on the two-dimensional plane defined by those two objectives? Way back to the left. Right, up and to the left. OK, so we move that point to its proper position now. OK, we're going to play the same game. Now, what can, what's the next one? Top of the line. What's that? Top of the line. The top of the line? Why top of the line? Because we're very we're optimistic. We're optimistic, right? OK. I, I don't know. I'm not as optimistic as I was a couple slides back. Right? <laughs> Maybe the, vo the very bottom, right? So the very bottom, we probably know what the transferability of that one is going to be, right? But we definitely are no longer going to pick the next one because we know that controllers that manage to get the robot about this far don't transfer very well. We only know it for one, but probably anything that is close, quote unquote, to this controller, let's try and do so let's try and pick a different one. But what do we mean by close? Right? How do we actually define the distance between two controllers? So the intuition is something that has similar behavior is also probably going to have similar transferability. So again, Slayton was trying to be a little bit conservative and pick something from the middle. Right? Intuitively, we know that things that you get the simulated robot to travel a very long distance in simulation like causing the robot to break into 12 pieces and fly apart to get a fitness of 1,000, those are probably not going to transfer very well to, to reality. So we might go and try and do something different. But again, how do we define similar or different? OK. OK, so the solution now is that we're going to try and estimate the transferability of a controller before we transfer it to reality based on its similarity 
to a controller that we've already transferred to reality. Okay. Which, of course, brings up the next question about how to measure the similarity between behaviors. So we're not going to measure the similarity between the controllers themselves, right? A controller, from our point of view, is just a matrix of synaptic weights. We could take the difference, the Euclidean distance between the set of synaptic weights in two controllers. So we could say, how different are the controllers? But that doesn't work very well. You remember our discussion a couple weeks back about the competing conventions problem, that two different networks may actually be computing similar functions but in different places. Likewise, two controllers that are actually have very similar synaptic weights might actually end up producing very different behaviors. It's not reliable to compare controllers directly. What we're going to do instead is to take two controllers, generate simulated behavior from those two controllers, and compare the similarity between the two behaviors rather than the two controllers. Okay, so the way that the authors did this in the original paper was to define a behavior B as a vector, and that vector is made up of a number of features of the, of the behavior. So they picked three different features here. What was the distance traveled by the robot? What was the mean height of the robot during travel? So like the evil starfish did the robot lie on the ground and crawl along the ground, or did it stand up and walk or produce some legged gait? So what was the mean height of that? And what was the final orientation of the robot? Again, remember when I showed you the Evil Starfish Resilient Machines project last time? The robot walked in a semicircle and it ended up pointing 180 degrees differently from how it started. So we're defining just these three numbers. We evaluate the robot in simulation. It does its thing. And when it finishes walking, we measure these three numbers. So we have a vector of three numbers that describes behavior. And now we can define the distance by just taking the Euclidean distance between three vectors, uh, between two vectors, B1 and B2. So B1 is the behavior produced by controller one and behavior two is the behavior produced by controller two. Make sense? So if we have two controllers, we run them on uh, the robot, and the robot travels the, the two robots travel the same distance. They maintain more or less the same height, uh, and they end up with the same final orientation. The distance between them is more or less zero. Right? If they differ in how far they travel, how they travel, and how they end up, then we get a distance that's greater than, than zero. Make sense? OK. OK, how do we now take this behavioral distance and use it to define transferability? We're going to define the transferability of any given controller i as the negative of its distance uh, the negative of the Euclidean distance of how the simulated robot moved using controller I and how the real robot moved using controller I. Right? How far did it get? How did, how, what height did it maintain? What was its final orientation when we, when we evaluated controller I in the simulated robot and in the real robot? Why negative here? We want to think about transferability as something we're trying to maximize, right? So what is the, what is the highest possible value for transferability we can get in this case? Zero, right? That's the optimal that we want, right? No difference between these two features in the simulated robot and the real robot. The more negative transferability is, the worst, the worst transferability is for, for that controller. So now let's forget about this for a moment and just think about transferability C. We can at least compute it if we evaluate the robot on the simulated and real robot. But remember that we want to try and be able to estimate the transferability of a controller before we move it from simulation to, to reality. Right? How are we going to do that? Well, again, 
we're going to use uh, we're going to use the distance here, and we're going to also use CT, which is the set of already T for transferred controllers. How does this actually work here? The estimated transferability, let's imagine we have a controller C in the population, and we want to know how, transferable, how transferable do we think controller C is. Well, let's compare C against all the other controllers that, are, have, that have already been transferred to reality. Let's take each of those already transferred controllers in turn, and we'll call it CI. And we now want to look at what is the distance between the behavior produced by C and the behavior produced by CI in simulation. So how close are they? Basically, what's the vertical component? What's the vertical distance between those points? And we're going to multiply it by this term here. And this term takes a little bit to wrap your mind around here. Well, we're comparing C to CI. So the first thing we want to know is, well, how transferable was CI? And how close was CI to C? So this second term here is actually weighting the term. Right? The influence on the prediction of how transferable C is is weighted by how close CI is to C. Let's try and build up your intuition for this equation by doing a couple of examples. Let's imagine we have controller C. And there's another controller that we've already transferred to reality, CI, and that controller transferred beautifully, right? Very high transferability for CI, and CI is very close to C. So we have a large numerator, CI was very transferable, and we have a very small denominator because it's close, right? So a big part, a big chunk of our estimate about the, transferable, the transferability for C is being influenced by CI. So if um, two controllers got the robot to the same exact point, yep. but through you know, vastly different means, like one is peristalsis, the other is um, legged locomotion, yes. their actual you know, phenotype is different. That's right. But they'll be measured equally transferable. Yeah, equally transferable. So this is a great point. So let's imagine two controllers have already been transferred to reality. One does it with peristalsis, one does it with legged locomotion. Right. And they both transferred well. So both of the, the two controllers, let's call them CI and CJ, had high transferability. But let's imagine that we're controlling them, uh, that we're comparing them to a controller C. And C produces peristaltic motion. Right. So it's closer to one of those two than it is to the other. It's right. closer to the one that did peristalsis. That distance is going to be small. Right. So the transferability of CI, which was the peristaltic robot, right. has more of an influence on our prediction of the transferability of C okay. than CJ, right. which right. was right. the right. controller that produced legged locomotion. Why is it closer? Because of the XYZ difference? Not because of the XYZ difference. Closer in this sense. Right. So think about a robot that does peristalsis and travels by legged locomotion. They both might get a very similar value for F1. They, mo they might both get the robot to travel the same distance, but they're going to have very different F2s. The peristalting robot is going to have a low value for F2. That's because the mean height of the robot stays XYZ. low. That's what I meant by XYZ. Oh, XY for these three. Right, so not XYZ of the position, final position of the robot. We're right. talking about features that describe the behavior. So the peristaltic one would move in a low exactly. way. Exactly, exactly. So they would, they would be different. If we compare this vector for the walking robot to this vector for the peristaltic robot, the distance would be non-zero. Make sense? Okay, let's go back to this equation for a moment. Let's imagine we're still trying to compute the, we're tr still trying to compute an estimation of transferability for C. Let's imagine that there is a CI that we have transferred from simulation to reality. It had very high transferability, but it, but it moved very different. CI produced a robot that moved very differently from C. 
right? That's going to have a relatively small influence on our estimate here. So this equation basically tells us that if I'm C, I'm looking at all the other CIs that have already been transferred to the robot. I'm looking at the transferability of all of those CIs, and their transferabilities are influencing my estimated transferability based on how close they are to me. So if I'm surrounded, if I have a whole bunch of CIs that are close to me that have low transferability, then the estimate for the transferability of C is going to be, we don't think C is going to transfer very well from simulation to reality. Yes? So they have all the same influence? I'm sorry? So they have all the same influence in the exercise? The features have the same influence, right? F1 and F2 and F3 all have the same influence. They all contribute to computing distance, right? But the different CIs in the population the different CIs that have been transferred from simulation, they have different influence. The closer a CI is to C, the more it influences the estimation of transferability for C. Yeah? So if I'm transfer, if I'm surrounded by controllers that had low transferability, good chance is that I'm also going to have low transferability. If I'm surrounded by a whole bunch of CIs that had high transferability, chances are I'm also going to have high transferability. Makes sense, right? So maybe for this robot, peristalsis tends to transfer well and walking doesn't, or vice versa. We don't know a priori. This would help us automatically determine that. Make sense? Okay. Okay, so let's just go back to our little cartoon back here, right? So now we know what we mean by similar and different behavior. We're not going to transfer this point here because this point is close to this point and is likely going to have similar transferability. So let's go after a different behavior. <clears throat> OK, so which one? We could go with the one that's most different, which is actually what they're going to do in this case. We're going to find in the population, we're going to look at all the controllers that have not yet been transferred to reality. And we're going to send that con the controller to reality that's most different from all the ones that we have sent to reality. How do we compute how different a given controller is? Well, we're going to de de define this as the diversity of C. So how diverse or how unique or how novel is C? And in order to compute this, we're going to use, again, distance. So. We're going to take C, we're going to compare it to all the other controllers that we've already sent to reality, and we're going to set its diversity to be the minimum of all of those distance computations. Why the minimum? So we, we, want, to, we want to look for the controller, uh, the controller that is different. We're going to define its difference or its uniqueness using this minimum. Why minimum? So again, imagine that I'm C, and I'm surrounded by a whole bunch of CI that have already been transferred to reality. I am very distant, let's imagine, from all of the CIs except one. There's one CI that's very, very close to me. I'm very similar. Let's imagine that I, per I move using peristalsis, and there is one other controller we've sent to reality that also moves using peristalsis. Okay. So I'm only as different as my closest neighbor, which makes sense. Right? We want to send the one that's as different as possible. Okay, so we still are not quite there yet, right? We've got a whole bunch of controllers that have not yet been sent to reality. We want to send the one that's most different. Which one are we going to send? We're going to use diversity now. We compute diversity for all of the controllers that we have not yet sent to reality. Which one do we send? We're almost there. <laughs> the one with the largest diversity. The one with the largest diversity, right? So here we go. You want to take the maximum of the minimum, right? Find the diversity of all of your C's and send the one that is most diverse. Right? Makes sense. 
Okay, so we're almost there. Here we go. Uh, okay, so here's the one I showed you before, right? So this was near, towards the beginning of one of their evolutionary simulations. And then we saw how this transferred to reality. Okay, so they used this process then. Before I show you the second video here, let me back up a little bit. So they evolved using this multi-objective approach, right, where they were evolving controllers uh, to be uh, to get the robot to travel as far as possible, to uh, have a greatest estimate of transferability. At every generation, we send one and only one controller to reality, right? So obviously, if we're simulating 100 different controllers, we don't want to have to evaluate all 100 controllers in reality. We're only going to send one of those 100 to uh, one of those 100 to reality. And typically, we're going to do it in this way, right? We're going to start by sending the one that got as far as possible, which typically is going to have low transferability. <laughs> if we applied that estimate of transferability, we probably would have sent this one next then this one, then this one, then this one, and, and so on, right? So we're sending very different controllers to reality at every generation and building up a way of predicting what transfers well and what doesn't. You can imagine as this evolutionary process continues, as you're getting towards the end, you're sending things that are relatively different, but not as different as before because you filled out quite a bit of this space. And hopefully your estimate of transferability is getting better, so things that you think are going to transfer well actually transfer well. Which, at least in the experiment they reported on in the paper, that was actually the case. Okay, all right, I've been building up to this, so let's actually see this. Here's a controller that maximizes distance and also had a very high estimate of transferability. Here it is transferred to reality. So, they had a good estimate of transferability. It actually transferred well. Okay, now the million dollar question. What the heck is the difference between these two gates that makes one transferable and one doesn't? Let's watch the two different simulated ones. Here's one that didn't transfer well. Oh, I can't play these at the same time. I apologize. This one transferred well. This one, oh, sorry, that one did not transfer well. This one did. Luckily, with the transferability method, we don't need to know a priori, but it's fun to try and figure out what the difference is. On the top one, Aha, uh -huh. yeah, and vice versa for the other two. Uh, actually, not quite. Huh? Okay, so the front right and bottom left tends to be in phase. That is no longer true here, right? The, um, well, hold on before we before we move on from that. What is it about that that might make it more or less transferable? With the wheels, it would would need some way to push off from the back. Um, but if they were moving at the same time and the other legs were kind of up in the air, it wouldn't have really anything pushing off. I see. That, that could be the case, maybe. Other ideas? Oh, um, about the robot or about the legs specifically? About why one is oh, yeah. transferable uh, so top, and one isn't. The top drags <clears throat> its torso, like the carriage on the ground. Um, so the angle at which it's kind of lowered is a uh, much, well, it's much lower. Is it dragging its torso? It's maybe. Not dragging, but it's, it's much lower to the ground. Okay, um, compared to this one? Yeah. See? And the oscillation is much higher. Yeah, so that's true. In the top, the torsos are stably low. 
Um, but in the bottom, this is probably due to uh, the interface of the legs. But okay, so I'm going to ask you the same off. question now, right? What is it about a low center of mass that makes it less transferable? Well, for one, um, in the robot, it might have gotten caught. You know, like the friction of the uh, torso against the ground might have been more. That might be hard to simulate. That could be. That could yeah. be. That might be a part of it. Other guesses? I see a big difference in the rear leg motion. So uh, the top one, it lifts up its rear legs more than on the bottom one. Mm. The bottom one, it kind of pushes off of them. It seems like there's more friction there. Yeah, it's, could be. It's almost more like swimming. Yeah. Kind of like kicks out. Yeah, it could be. Could be. I mean, what you would really like to see is the forces here, right? It's hard to see how much force is pushing against the ground and how perpendicular that force is to the ground plane, right? One of the things that's particularly hard for physics engines to get right is simulating forces that are applied when pairs of objects come into contact with, with one another, right? That is definitely one of the places that causes, one aspect of physics engines that causes the the gap. Okay. But obviously, these gates, at least from our point of view, look, look the same, right? If I were to actually show these individually on a slide, it would probably be hard for you to know which is which before we just had this, this discussion, right? So whatever the, whatever the reality gap is, it's tricky because there's no easy answer, right? It's not things that are low to the ground transfer well or don't or, or what have you, right? There's very subtle interactions that go on between an embodied agent's actions and the sensory repercussions of, of that action. Okay, I think we'll leave it there. Just one note again about multi-objectivization. So here they were uh, maximizing behavior and transferability. It doesn't have to be transferability, right? You could add something else in for multi-objectivization. If you're doing the biped, you might want to maximize displacement of the robot and maintaining the height of the hip over, over time, right? If it's stair climbing, maintain climbing up the stairs, but minimize banging your foot into the front of the rung of each uh, part of the, the steps, right? Multi-objectivization is a good, good tool to use. Think about, think about using it. Okay, you have a quiz due tonight. Uh, Mark Wagey will be here on Thursday to introduce you to the crowdsourcing of robotics. Thank you.